have Shahul with us, who likes to travel, who likes to read books, and yeah, he has visited a lot of places in India as well as out of India. Yeah. So please welcome Shahul. I'm going to talk about my experience building op some of the best open source models that are available through Open Assistant. By sharing my experience, I hope that I uh, encourage some of you, at least many of you, to uh, you know, contribute to open source AA as well. And uh, through this talk, I have tried to be inclusive in a way that uh, this can be heard and understood by anyone who is in the, you know, anywhere in the AA spectrum from uh, a prompt engineer to a researcher. So, yeah. So uh, let's get in. Uh, so a bit about myself, um, Shahul ES, uh, ML research and engineering background. I, I contributed some of the open source models and I'm currently building Ragas, which is an open source framework for uh, evaluation and continual improvement of uh, LLM applications. So that's about me. Um, yeah, so this talk is generally divided into four parts. First thing is a little bit about Open, open Assistant AI. The other, the second part is about building and the most, you know, the secrets behind creating best quality open source uh, large language models. Then we'll cover some challenges and then uh, the future of uh, open source A. Right, so let's get, yeah. So here, uh, yeah, it started around late 2022. ChatGPT was out, everyone was very excited. People are trying it out, but but not few. So these few people, they knew that if uh, the technology as an as A is going to be closed source in future, this is going to be something that anyone can explore and understand. So it is going to be something that resides in with, within organizations and is mostly controlled by monopoly. So to avoid such situation, we started this uh, open assistant initiative as a vision to create open source large language models and release it, release the data set, everything we have um, uh, in, open, in an open source way so that anyone can access and experiment with it. So uh, the vision, as I said, was to create an open source chat based uh, assistant. And uh, regarding the roadmap, we had instruct GPT paper to, uh, with us to replicate. Basically, for those who don't know, Instruct GPT is the paper behind ChatGPT. It uh, really, uh, you know, underlays the techniques that is used to that can be used to create such high-quality large language models and serve it to millions. So again, uh, for uh, for our contributors, we had people like Yanni uh, Klitscher, who is very influential figure in uh, AA field. Through his uh, through his distribution, we got. Uh, a lot of contributors from around the world, uh, Europe, US, and also association with some of the best uh, universities across the world. So this uh, also gave us the um, chance to uh, act access to the compute that is required to create and run these experiments. So yeah, so that's about Open Assistant. Up next, yeah, we started off with this vision and uh, we had the roadmap in place. We know what to do, now it's execution time. For execution, uh, what we see here is, we had three steps ahead of us to create such thing. The first, um, the first thing is creation of instruction data set to fine tune and create such models. The other thing, the second step is to actually do the fine tuning and the third step is our ledge of alignment. So we'll uh, go, to, go through each of these steps in detail. First step, as I said, is the creation of uh, as, uh, an instruction data set so that we can get these pre-trained models and fine tune it in a way that it is useful and follows instructions. So basically I've shown here an example of how uh, an instruction data set looks like. Basically the data set will contain a, sim a, a set of instructions which is the input to the model and we will have a response which we expect as the output from the model. So an instruction data set will contain you know, hundreds of thousands of these kinds of instructions. To create such instructions, we can follow two approaches. The first approach is to create 
and uh, create this by human annotation. Basically, you'll have uh, thousands of humans sitting and annotating and creating instructions and responses. This is one way, but this way is really expensive because human time is expensive. It is very slow because humans are slow. And then, it, then but it, the positive side of this is that it creates high quality, very, very high quality data set because it goes through uh, you know, uh, a human. The other way we can create the same is synthetic data set creation. In synthetic data set creation, what we do is we use other LLMs and plus some techniques on top of it to create these instructions and response pairs, which can be used to train or fine tune new LLMs. So that's, this approach is really cheap because we have to only run other LLMs and we have to process it programmatically. And it is really fast and it, is, it yields uh, samples of medium to high quality as well. So we, as an open assistant, followed synthetic data creation. Then, uh, then this is something that I want to clear with you. So you might have seen uh, language models that can follow instructions but cannot chat with you. So what is the difference between a language model that can only follow one short instruction and, uh, and a language model that can chat with you as in a back and forth as in an assistant way? So basically the difference lies in uh, the type of data which is used to fine tune it. So if you see here, uh, the input here is actually a conversation rather than one instruction and output here is a response to the conversation. So basically if you create such a multi-turn data set and fine tune a model with that data set, you'll, uh, you'll elicit such capabilities, such conversational capabilities in the model. So since Open Assistant was mainly focused on creating chat-based assistants, we were mostly focused on creating data sets in such formats. right? So that's about data set creation. So we currently we do have uh, a pre-trained model, let's say any pre-trained model, and we do have a data set to which we want to fine tune it. And next, up next the process is actual fine tuning. So in actual, I, I wanna I wanna explain what actually fine tuning does, which because it's a highly misunderstood concept. So fine tuning really helps a pre-trained a pre-trained model by its by its nature is just a fancy autocomplete thing. It really can't understand or follow your instructions or even chat with you. So how can we take this pre-trained model and make sure that it follows instructions and it can act as an assistant that can chat back and forth with you? So this capability, this instruction following capability is what we, um, it, it, it is what we see and we try to elicit using fine tuning techniques. So. That is, that is the goal of fine tuning, to take these pre-trained models and make it follow instructions very well and help, help it to reach a quality so that it can chat with you back and forth. So what it doesn't do here is to infuse no, new knowledge into uh, LLMs. For example, if you have an LLM which is only pre-trained on biological data, it basically only has seen biological tokens. And if you take that model, base model, and fine tune it on something like code generation, it is not going to work. Because at its core nature, the model does not really know what is coding and all that stuff. So the pre-training stage, the model has only seen biological tokens or co-tokens related to biology. Uh, yeah, so for that particular reason, it does not really inject new knowledge into it. It only elicits knowledge which is uh, already present in the model. So again, Pre-training, uh, fine-tuning as a process is very cheaper than uh, pre-training. Yeah. So, yeah. So currently, we have uh, a model which we have fine-tuned, and the model currently can follow instructions very well. Now, what we need to do is, okay, this model. Let's say this model can instruction follow instruction very well and everything. But the model, if we if we give that model to a customer-facing application and the customer asks something which can elicit some, some toxic behavior. For example, it could be something like, okay, uh, can you justify the actions of Nazis, uh, all that stuff. So the model doesn't really understand human values. It's, it's basically going to come up with answers, which is not acceptable to us as in the values that we have uh, uh, evolved throughout the period of time. So the idea with model alignment here is to give that, uh, you know, 
teach the model a little bit of civic sense in a way that it understands the human values and it performs in a way that it adheres to human values as well. So when we say about alignment in the machine learning perspective, we generally mean three H. The first H means helpfulness, second H is harmlessness, and third H is honesty. So these are the three main, uh, you know, um, three main things that we want to convey to this model so that it behaves as if it is, uh, it, it adheres to the, you know, uh, culture and values of uh, human society and doesn't do anything that uh, go against our safety. So this process, the process where we teach model a level of civic sense is done using something called reinforcement learning with human feedback. Basically the process can be, uh, you know, split into two. The first thing is reward modeling and second thing is RL. Uh, basically, reward modeling approach uh, is uh, basically now we want we have a model. It can follow instructions. It can chat with you. Just that we want to impart the knowledge of human values into it. So how can we do it? To do it, we can uh, go with a basic thing of you know how. Let's say we have an input. We have uh, three outputs from the same model. We want a different a model to understand. Which of these which of these output are actually preferred by humans? So that's the idea of uh, reinforcement learning with human feedback. So we train a new model that can actually go and pick up, uh, you know, samples that are preferred by human. And with with using this preference modeling, what we do is we first take our fine-tuned model and combine it with this preference model and do an RL thing in a way that it, uh, it aligns in a way that it does not speak anything that goes against our values. So that, that's the basic thing about uh, uh, reinforcement learning with human feedback. Yeah, so this, yeah. So currently, let's say we have fine-tuned the model, we have aligned the model, and uh, we have got a model that it can be used in production. So during this process, we, we usually face several challenges during this whole process, right? So the first challenge here is the creation of uh, diverse and high quality synthetic data. So the model, mo any model or any machine learning model works in a way that it is like garbage in, garbage out. So if you have something, uh, a data, data is something that shares the nature and the quality of the model as well. So creating a high quality and diverse data to fine tune this model is a challenging task and it's still a challenging task because especially since we are going with the synthetic data generation. So this was one of the first challenges we faced. Most of the time we spend in data creation uh, was spending creating synthetic data. Then uh, we have uh, things like, uh, you know, the confusion of choosing behind, the confusion of choosing behind things like full fine tuning or should we go for any new fancy techniques that can run in, you know, less compute, uh, like adapter techniques, which some of you might have heard. So, you know, so there is this thing of choosing between the current models. Yeah, just finishing up. So, uh, yeah, regarding, uh, regarding creating such thing, there is another part that of uh, reward modeling, which is lack of data to create such reward models. And uh, RLHF can also negatively impact uh, the model's performance. Uh, because maybe like one, one thing we saw that uh, during, during RLHF, once we have a model, uh, it might, you know, it, it knows coding and everything. After doing alignment, it might forget some specific aspect, like, you know, it, it, it might mess up with math. So other aspect is just scaling. So it's, it's just an image here that can um, uh, show you how, how, you know, basically the scale, model scaling works. We have scaled models from 3 billion to 70 billion and uh, the infrastructure we worked on ranges from 1,800 to 3,200. Yeah, uh, regarding uh, the future of open source AI, the vision I, that I'm trying to sell here is the goal of open source AI is not to compete with closed source AI. It is to make sure that this technology, this wonderful technology is accessible to everyone who likes to play around with it and who wants to explore, uh, you know, explore the technology as in general. And these are some of the things that I've uh, seen which is very promising. One thing is continual pre-training. Other is moving from sparse to dense models and the multimodality. 
Uh, yeah, these are advanced to give topics if anyone would like to you know, speak with me on this or in general about LLMs, come talk to me. I'm also in Twitter. So you can, if you, anyone wants slides, uh, here is this link to slides. Uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, thank you.